the raw resources, Navajo resources, were purchased at low prices, rock bottom prices. Navajo water from Upper Basin Colorado River was used to help with the operation of the Navajo generating station. We waived our rights to claim any of that water for the duration of the power plant and we never got any payment for it. I'm 50 years old and these guys are just now leaving. And I've spent the prime of my life battling the, the pollution here and, and not being able to herd sheep on my family ancestral land and not being able to farm here. And so I never got a chance to use any of this land. You've been listening to an excerpt of Nation and Transition, the second film in the current Revolution Energy Transition film series from American Resilience Project. That was the voice of Nicole Horseherder, founder of To Nijoni Ani, or Sacred Water Speaks in the Diné language, talking about the legacy of the Navajo Generating Station, one of the largest coal plants in U.S. history, which operated on the Navajo Nation in northern Arizona for four decades, until it was decommissioned in 2019 and then ultimately demolished in 2020. I'm Roger Sorkin, the director of the American Resilience Project, where we make films designed to influence public policy, inspire cultural change, and strengthen civilizational security. Our guest today is Wahela Johns, who grew up on the Navajo Nation and who was born around the same time that the coal plant began its operations there. Wahela Johns is now the director of the Indian Energy Office at the U.S. Department of Energy, where she works to help provide reliable, affordable energy across Indian country and help accelerate the transition away from fossil fuels. Wahela joins us today to talk about her work and offer a status report from the Energy Transition Frontlines. Director Johns, you asked to be addressed as Wahela, so Wahela, welcome to the American Resilience Podcast. Thank you for having me. So to begin, tell us about the office that you run, the Indian Energy Office at the U.S. Department of Energy, how and when it came about, and the mission you're trying to accomplish. Yes, so we um, were established in 2005 from the Energy Policy Act, and our office is charged by Congress to promote Indian energy development, efficiency and use, um, two, to reduce or stabilize energy costs, Three, enhance and strengthen Indian tribal energy and economic development, um, economic infrastructure. And four, bring electrical power and service to Indian land and the homes. So this is our statute. Um, We've designed our program. We offer financial assistance to uh, federally recognized tribes. And we also offer technical assistance at no cost to tribes. So if tribes Uh, make that request, we can offer technical assistance and support. And technical assistance also includes uh, financial analysis, technical analysis, um, strategic energy planning, um, you know, visioning. Um, So we we have a whole menu of technical assistance support. And then we also do um, education and outreach. And so we hold uh, monthly webinars uh, to help inform tribes of some of the funding opportunities, but also just sort of the basics. And if you're thinking about, you know, going solar, what does that what does that entail? Um, so uh, you can find all of our information on our website. We have a great website. We have a tribal atlas as well. Um, we have funding opportunities, and then there's all of our projects that we've supported, and it's on a map. And so you can see where we've supported with uh, projects, but also um, where we've supported with um, technical assistance. And so I'm really proud of this office because uh, we, we've been um, a small office and we have an office in Anchorage, Alaska, Golden, Colorado, and here in headquarters in D.C. And our team is growing. And because we are seeing, uh, you know, a lot of tribes wanting to uh, apply uh, clean energy into their communities and nations. And so um, we hope to get out $100 million in this year to clean energy projects, which is really exciting. Um, We have a funding opportunity right now 
that ends, I think, February 13th. Um, and then we'll be announcing uh, soon um, 50 million towards clean energy projects. Um, and this is for um, mostly shovel ready projects that are ready to go. Um, so more, more on our website. Um, we also um, are going to make a funding opportunity available for tribal colleges and universities to go 100% towards clean energy. And so that's really exciting. And I think we have, you know, over 30 tribal colleges and universities throughout, um, throughout the United States. So, yeah, it's been really fun to be in this role for the past two years and to continue to build, um, you know, this team and the vision that this team has. And, um, you know, all of it is guided by tribes and um, the feedback we've been receiving from tribal nations. And so it's really cool. And we were also work closely with um, the White House Council on Native American Affairs uh, team in uh, other agencies on, um, you know, many efforts. So it, it's been awesome. So you're a member of the Navajo Nation. You grew up there and you were born right about the same time as when the coal plant began its operation. So you've had an experience growing up with energy in ways that most Americans don't experience. That's to say with very unreliable energy. Can you talk a little bit about growing up on the Navajo Nation where energy has been unreliable, even though the coal plant generated reliable energy for large cities like Las Vegas and Los Angeles, and how this energy experience has either changed or remained the same over the last 40 years? Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's no different than today. I mean, we have my parents haul water. We don't have access to running water. And then we got off-grid solar with battery storage. So we live, um, you know, five miles from the transmission and um, line. So even to extend a transmission line, it's about $40,000 per mile. And that's the low end. And so, um, you know, I think that when you think about rural remote communities, even just the cost of um, equipment, the cost of labor um, to these really remote areas, it, the, the price you know tag goes up, and um, so it makes it very hard and expensive to do energy systems in rural remote communities. And um, I come from again a community that has been you know um, very strong as far as our language and our culture. And um, we're, we raise sheep and um, cattle and horses, and we're sort of ranchers, but we're also uh, farmers. And, you know, the main thing for us is making sure that we sustain that life and then we sustain um, the water that we have. I mean, we, we have groundwater. And, and I think that's been one, you know, if, as far as my teachings with uh, my elders is that, um, you know, this, this value of taking care of land in our communities. And, um, and it, it's a, again, it's just a really, uh, I'm, I'm honored to be able to have an upbringing like that. And when I do go home, it's, you know, I know exactly, um, my role too. I mean, it's, it's, it changes because it's, it's, it's a different type of work. <laughs> um, we have to work at even just being able to maintain home and, um, yeah, and I just want to say, like, there's a lot of families that still um, live like that, including my parents. So what can the rest of the United States learn from tribal nations in order to help accelerate the energy transition overall? And how can this be done in a way that's equitable for all former coal communities, whether they're on tribal lands or not? Well, tribes, um, as the Navajo Nation and the Hopi tribe, have been... Uh, a big part of the engine or the powerhouse for the build out of the entire West. You have cities like Los Angeles, Las Vegas, San Francisco, uh, Phoenix, and Arizona. Actually, the way that they were able to get their uh, water was because of Navajo and Hopi coal, was because of Navajo and Hopi labor. Um, so, and, and then yet over the hill from these. Um, operations, you have communities uh, that are rural and still don't have access to uh, basic infrastructure like uh, electricity. Or many of our people still haul water. 40% of our people haul water. Um, unpaved roads. 
So there is a huge um, need in, in these uh, communities to better support um, infrastructure, but also economic development opportunities. And I, and I think, you know, that story of, you know, our, uh, Navajo and Hopi coal supporting the, uh, powering the entire West, and yet, you know, the, the communities right next to the coal mining operations don't have access to electricity today. We need to change that. And I think that you, you have to understand that when we talk about transition, we're talking about, um, you know, uh, looking at the communities that have been left behind. And I love that about this administration is that, you know, what can we learn from the lessons um, from, you know, the past 50 to 100 years of energy development in Indian country, but also throughout the country? Um, who, who has access to power? Who doesn't? And I think these are things that is come to light now and that we are creating uh, funding opportunities to support these communities um, because, you know, they, they're like sort of, I mean, I see them as just like being of service for so many years, letting us use their raw resources to power uh, American homes. Um, and it's time that we give back to these communities and the people, first, first people of this nation, should have um, access to broadband, should have access to all of the infrastructure that everyone is enjoying in the United States. And it, it makes me very sad that today, 2023, um, grandma and grandpa still don't have running water, still don't have electricity and basic infrastructure. And um, so that, that's something that I would love to see is, is um, more equitable um, outcomes from uh, these projects and this funding opportunities that are out there. So the Inflation Reduction Act is now law, and there's lots of federal money flowing to renewable energy projects. But what obstacles would you say still remain when it comes to speeding up the energy transition across Indian country? I think that with the some of the barriers that we've identified um, have been access to capital. And um, tribal lands, and you know, it, it's it's different than other um, designated lands. And um, you know, there's also reservations that don't have, um, can't you know, uh, have access to certain tax incentives that other uh, cities or townships may you know use. And when it comes to developing energy projects, um, you know, developers can seek you know, uh, tax incentives and get, um, you know, tax credits. And for s tribes, it's a little bit different. And so we have to get creative in the way that they can ha have access to um, funding opportunities, investment. Um, and sometimes people aren't familiar with Indian country and they are, you know, investors are sometimes, you know, th they don't know the lay of the land when it comes to Indian country. And, and I think that um, that area is one that I think could be really fruitful in not only in the business sector, but also for, uh, uh, you know, uh, intergovernmental relationships, but also um, private sector, public um, sector relationships with tribes. And uh, we don't, you know, I, I feel like we have to really, um, uh, if we want to really embrace transition and make it equitable, we have to also be uncomfortable. And um, we have to do business in a certain way that really um, reflects, you know, that, that equity piece. And part of that is making sure that tribes uh, know everything that they need to know um, and are informed with information that is um, uh, on different uh, development uh, projects, but also the, um, you know, designing it so that the people in the community benefit. And I think that's one area that I love about our office is that, you know, we've been seeing about over 100 projects in Indian country get developed uh, from micro, micro um, grids to solar, um, megawatts of solar uh, fields that are generating powder for themselves. And I, I love the, um, you know, tribes already taking, being proactive. It's, it, you know, uh, I would say over 10 years we've seen this trend. And before it became trendy, I guess, <laughs> is that tribes have been leading the way in transition because many of the, these communities and nations, they are in rural remote locations. 
and they have been feeling the impacts of climate change. And in preparation for whether it's fires or flooding, they have been uh, investing in hardware technology like solar, battery storage, wind, um, to prepare themselves for the next maybe potential climate you know, impact that, that could have on their community, their people. Um, so this is, you know, something that I feel like with tribes, they have been leading the way. And it's not like, uh, I would say it's not been, um, you know, showcased yet. And I, I think if you go a little bit deeper, you'll see these projects throughout Indian country. You're listening to the American Resilience Podcast from American Resilience Project. I'm Roger Sorkin, the director of the American Resilience Project. Be sure to visit us online at amresproject.org, where you can watch all of our films for free and learn about how you can take action on a number of resilience-related issues, including food security, sea level rise, clean energy, and more. American Resilience Project is a nonprofit We make all of our films available to watch for free. You can go to our website, amresproject.org, and please consider supporting our work with a tax-deductible donation. There used to be a lot of water around here. We didn't have to travel a distance to get water. So I would say that we spent more money for our water than people that have running water. Because we had to buy gas, we had to wear and tear on our vehicle to get water from the chapter house and haul them back for our drinking water or for our livestock. I'm glad that they're shutting it down. But we would like to see them to fix it the way it was before. And they just can't leave, you know, leave it like that and leave. That is the voice of Edith Simonson in our film Nation in Transition in the Current Revolution Energy Transition film series, talking about her family's difficulties accessing water in addition to electricity on the Navajo Nation. Our guest today is Wahela Johns, the director of the Indian Energy Office at the U.S. Department of Energy. And Wahela, recognizing that there's no one-size-fits-all approach to addressing the energy transition across Indian country or anywhere, and also recognizing that other entities like private companies and other layers of government are in the mix that have to be, what advice would you give to any investors or legislators or commissioners for utility commissions, anyone else who might want to or have to do business in Indian country in order to help accelerate the energy transition? Yeah, very simple. I mean, this is also within uh, government that we talk about is um, uh, we have to do our homework. Um, You know, there's a lot of uh, good uh, writings, uh, books, and about the history, uh, the Native American history. Um, There's over 574 federally recognized tribes, um, over 200 um, Alaska Native villages. And um, so we're very diverse in Indian country. And each tribal entity, tribe, has uh, a unique relationship, political relationship with the federal government. And... um, due to um, treaties. Uh, There's been uh, treaties that have been signed, and um, in those treaties, almost every nation has a treaty, and in there, um, it tells what tribes gave up. They gave up land, they gave up resources, in exchange for um, the federal government to help support with health care, with... homes with, uh, you know, there, there was an agreement. And I feel like, you know, this is part of the history and learning um, that we all need to do. And the status, the land status, the tax status, all of that is also embedded in 
a lot of these policies in federal Indian law. And it can get complicated. Um, and I think that piece, you know, is something that it would be wonderful for everyone to learn. It should be a requirement in our education system to understand, you know, what tribes, wherever we live, um, exist here. How, how can we create partnerships? Um, and deepening that understanding and connection um, because I, I feel like there's a lot of, you know, definitely stereotypes of our people that, you know, we don't pay taxes and, you know, everything's for free. That's not the case. Um, and so I feel like, um, it, it, you know, it's going to take all of us to, to I mean, I'm, I'm Navajo, but man, I'm learning a lot about uh, each tribe that I meet and their history and what their vision is and how can we be of support. And so, um, you know, if I'm struggling to learn and, you know, understand, you know, this lay of the land in Indian country, I'm sure a lot are, can, can be intimidated. So it's going to take that, I, I feel like, um, that uh, understanding and relationship. But also, you know, tribes, um, there's a lot of distress. So um, we have a lot of predator, you know, um, wh whatever it's like, uh, you know, lenders or <laughs> businesses that have come onto Indian country as well and have, um, you know, tribes have had ex bad experiences. And I think, you know, this is an area that I feel like with the federal government, we can help support to create more protection and, um, and help tribes actually, you know, achieve their energy uh, vision and achieve their, you know, to me, it's sovereignty. Um, they already have that, but I feel like there's um, ways that it can be strengthened. So one of the things that we're trying to do with this film is to highlight some of the similar challenges faced by rural communities. And I'm wondering how you think we can help rural communities come together around this common purpose, whether these rural communities are on tribal lands or not. Um, so, yes, I mean, I think there's definitely, um, you, there's, there's similarities, but again, going back to, um, tribal lands, uh, their jurisdiction, even just the status of their, their land status is so different than state lands. Um, opportunities, um, might be limited, um, and it, for tribes than states. And, and I think, um, one thing that comes up is like the Build Back Better regional challenge from um, the Economic Development Administration put out last, within the past year and a half. And it was um, a challenge to different regions of the country uh, to submit for funding, funding opportunity um, in helping to revitalize their economies in the regions. And so uh, I think from there we saw a lot of um, highlights of you know, partnerships, um, some between tribes and states or organizations um, that are in these kind of rural remote areas. And um, in the bipartisan infrastructure law, there is a lot of great opportunities for rural remote communities. Um, there's a billion dollars, for example, to support um, communities less than 10,000 people um, with energy infrastructure. Um, some of the energy challenges that rural remote communities face, um, there's that opportunity. and um, the US, um, USDA also has um, funding opportunities for, you know, utilities, rural utilities. Um, so, yeah, there's many examples where I've seen um, communities come together, tribal and non-tribal, to work towards, like, uh, uh, similar goals. And that there's also this interconnection and interdependency um, that can be, gener you know, that can be even more strengthened if, um, when it comes to power, electricity or power generation or even economic development opportunities. So uh, definitely, I think that, um, you know, it's really important that, you know, there's those partnerships. So understanding that tribal communities can be successful when they're working with outside entities, as we've seen in the film, uh, the example that we give is the Navajo Nation working with the Salt River Project, which is the utility that owned the Navajo Generating Station um, they work closely to decommission the plant and ultimately demolish the plant, help some of the workers get new jobs. Do you have any other examples of tribal communities 
working with outside entities to help accelerate the energy transition elsewhere in the country? Yes, I do. Um, actually, we're going to go be um, going to Northern California, uh, the Blue Lake Rancheria. It's uh, in Humboldt Bay area, and it's about 300 miles north of San Francisco. And um, they uh, wrote for a grant to support a um, solar microgrid. Uh, from our office, and they did this with many partners, and um, they also are doing other projects with the California Energy Commission, uh, the local utility industry, DOE's Idaho National Laboratory, and other um, local universities. And I think, you know, this is one area that um, they band together to address, you know, know, topics around climate change like wildfires, and they wanted to create a microgrid, solar microgrid, so you know, for backup um, power and storage. And so that is something that they have right now that is actually a really good example for many tribes that want to pursue solar microgrids. Um, But it also just speaks to, you know, how innovative tribes are. And, you know, I don't know if you've all been to Northern California, but this is an area, too, that where many Native American homes still don't have access to electricity or they have unreliable power. Um, because the transmission line, you know, many times doesn't reach reservations. And there's a whole history around that. You know, they have the 1923 um, uh, Rural Electrification Act, and many times that didn't reach tribes, tribal lands. So that this is why tribes are still struggling to get uh, reliable power, access to electricity. Um, but this is one example I feel like is really important because, um, you know, we're seeing that, again, uh, tribes taking the lead and, um, you know, responding to uh, climate change, but also, you know, the way that they design their energy systems are more resilient. And, um, but also they're building their capacity on how to design these systems and um, creating a workforce around. And I, I think it's really powerful. So acknowledging that there is a range of cultural and geographic diversity across Indian country. And I'm thinking here of indigenous communities, not just within the United States borders, but across the Western Hemisphere. What kind of international partnerships are there between indigenous communities? And how might this kind of international collaboration help with energy transitions around the world? Oh, absolutely. I mean, there's a lot of dialogue between different tribes on different, you know, in Canada, U.S., Mexico, I mean, before these boundaries, um, you know, uh, indigenous peoples were very, um, were traveling all the time and trading. And so uh, I think there's a some discussion with different tribes on, um, you know, uh, exchanging um, power, but also um, products. And um, that this is something that I think could be really um, amazing to see that type of international partnership between sovereign nations. And, um, and, and I think it also just picks up from the partnerships that have been there, the relationships that have been there for a long time, and, and something that I think a lot of uh, communities can learn from. And, you know, even though we have these borders, um, many people, many of indigenous people still have family on different sides of the borders and still do um, come together for gatherings and plan together. Um, and, and I think that's the unique um, side of indigenous people and native people is that um, we all uh, have a value that is um, tied to this land. This is our homeland and we understand this land. Uh, we have a communication with everything around us um, to the plant life, to um, the mountains, to the water, to um, this air. And we have a language, too, that is just so beautiful, a diverse of languages that, um, you know, it, when you do the translation, it's super unique and powerful and healing. And that's exactly, I feel like, uh, when you combine that, you know, indigenous knowledge and wisdom and voice to policy, to planning, to healing, uh, where we're at in, in, our, in our communities, in our country, and our globally. It's just really um, 
uh, hopeful. And, and that's, where, that's, that's where I come from, is a family and community like that. Uh, despite, you know, having gone through many um, challenges, economically, um, historically, I, I feel like our people are still very hopeful because we have this beautiful connection to everything around us. And that is, to me, um, energy. That is true essence of energy that um, I feel like our people carry as, as Native people. So finally, what advice would you give to the rest of us? What can we all do to help accelerate the transition, whether we live in Indian country or not? I think that um, it starts with uh, your home. And uh, I, I mean, this is how I got started is um, I wanted to see how solar worked and um, how to design it and how to apply it to my household. Um, but also it made me go into energy efficiency and there are ways, I mean, we have the Inflation Reduction Act and um, that has uh, many opportunities, uh, tax incentives for the consumer if they wanted to do energy efficiency upgrades or put on, you know, solar on their rooftop or put battery storage, um, you know, uh, switch out their um, uh, gas uh, stoves um, or uh, go, you know, I guess go electric. And I think that... Um, that's been something I've been excited to share more with Indian country. And, um, and it really it's, goes back to our household. I mean, I remember uh, years ago I was, uh, heard that the average American thinks about energy only eight minutes out of the whole year. Um, and that was uh, really interesting to me because, um, you know, coming from an energy burden community, you know, something that we thought about a lot. And, um, and I, and it, but also speaks to, you know, our disconnection to where power is being generated, um, who is involved with that, uh, you know, how do I get involved and active in, um, you know, policy or um, wanting to, you know, see how we can advocate for, um, advocating for like clean energy or whatever. So, yeah, I feel like, you know, there's a lot of research you have to do <laughs> locally um, to be more active. Um, but I think there's a lot of amazing organizations and initiatives happening in the states. Um, but definitely through the um, Inflation Reduction Act, there's uh, many opportunities for the home consumer. Um, so I, I would start there. And then uh, you can go into community. You know, you can start... Uh, organizing with your community and your neighbors to, um, if you want, you know, for example, um, maybe your children's school to go renewable energy. That's another thing that um, I also w participated in. <laughs> and just trying to, like, really understand, um, you know, how, how do we apply some and do our part to apply uh, solar or battery storage to our homes, to our schools, um, and then also, you know, to our community or nation. And, and so you start to, it starts to get, um, you know, a little bit more complicated, but also really fun. And it creates partnership and connection. And I think that's really key is that, you know, coming out of COVID, um, there's been, you know, we've been isolating ourselves. And now we're, you know, trying to be, um, you know, address climate change. And I think that, there's a lot of room for connection and partnerships um, where everyone can feel safe and comfortable. But that, that is something that I would love to see more and more happen. Um, and, and I feel like that unity is really um, key in, in the way that we move forward to address um, the climate crisis and that we also just all have a role to play. Well, Wahela Johns, director of the U.S. Department of Energy's Indian Energy Office and member of the Navajo Nation, thank you so much for joining us on the American Resilience Podcast. Thank you for your important work, and we wish you the greatest success. Thank you. You've been listening to the American Resilience Podcast from American Resilience Project. Be sure to visit us online at amresproject.org, that's A-M-R-E-S project.org, 
where you can sign up for our mailing list. You can watch all of our films for free and learn more about getting involved in a number of different issues from the energy transition to coastal resilience to food security. This program is available on all major podcast platforms, and please do leave us a review. Today's show is produced by American Resilience Project with editing help from Joseph Skinner and music by the great John Cabot. For all of us at American Resilience Project, thank you for listening and supporting us because civilization deserves a fighting chance.